Right. Eva, it's, uh, it's great to have you back on the podcast today. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Adam. Thanks for having me back. No, you're welcome. It's uh, really great to connect. I think last time we connected was like last last summer, I think, sometime last summer, last year. Oh, no, it was a while ago. It was a yeah. while ago. Oh, yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's it's awesome to have you back. And yeah, I just kind of thought like kind of introducing you because you're, you're like a high performance coach and you help like um, people in, in that kind of area, don't you, as well. And you've got like a book out recently that you you, you mentioned to me. Um, it's called The Intimate Intimacy of Race and how you kind of came about that and what that's kind of about as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, no, I, I really like helping people who, you know, when they are really doing everything that they can to, you know, have more money, more success, better health, better relationships. Mm. And what happens is, you know, you know how people end up doing too much and they get burnt out and stressed out and overwhelmed. So when I bring into high performance coaching, I really help people learn how to prioritize and set boundaries so that they can have a better balance. And by balance, mm. I don't mean equal, but just really not sacrifice what's important to them when they are working so hard. And so, you know, I'm running along with the business and everything's going great with my clients. I started this amazing group program. And then, you know, I'm in America, the George Floyd incident happened. And I know yeah. that that was worldwide. Everybody had heard about that. And you know, I was just about to launch my high performance group coaching, but I was really overcome with a lot of sadness and grief over literally watching this man be murdered mm -hmm. by a police officer. And I remember I just couldn't stop crying. I was crying every night, but like really deep guttural cries. And if you know me really well, I'm not a crier. I'm just really kind of tough as nails and I can get through everything. And yeah, as yeah. a black woman, we're almost kind of used to or numb to the fact that this is what happens to men, our black men and, and being in police custody. We almost got used to, to seeing black men, you know, being murdered by the police and the police brutality that seems to be predominantly towards people of color. And I remember thinking um, that I had to do something, you know, I just couldn't have business as usual, but I didn't know what to do. And there was one morning I have my high performance morning routine where, you know, I do my workout and have my special drink. And I was sitting in my, my morning meditation, just really, kind of feeling lost and wondering what could I do? Like, I'm not gonna go out and protest cause we're in COVID and I'm a germaphobe. So I don't wanna get sick, <laughs> yeah. but I can't ignore it. You know, it was kind of like, there's an elephant in the room and I can't ignore it. And what dropped into me at that point was, and, and I've shared with you before that my husband's from Germany. So he is not African-American at all. And I saw on social media, a lot of people who were either white, white presenting, or had a certain amount of privilege because of the color of their skin, really wanting to help, wanting to do something, wanting to use their voice, wanting to speak up about and against racism. However, they were saying all the wrong things and it was making it worse. <laughs> You know, you were hearing things like all lives matter. Um, I don't see color. And, you know, I was raised to treat everybody equally. And it was for the black community. It was pouring salt in the room. And it's the equivalent of, you know, doing a fundraiser for breast cancer. And someone else comes on and says, well, what about lung cancer? Isn't lung cancer important? Well, yes, it is. But right now, this fundraiser is for breast cancer. <laughs> and so it was, um, you know, I saw their heart. Let me put it to you this way. I saw their heart. I saw their intention. But the things they were saying were making it worse. And so what dropped in for me right then was to create a safe space to share resources to help people learn not only um, why some of those phrases are wrong and some of the things that they were saying is wrong, but just resources in education 
to learn a little bit more about the history, to learn how to have these conversations, how to take a stand without being judged, without being criticized, without feeling the shame, the blame and the guilt over making a mistake. Because you know, what happens to people when they think about what if I make a mistake and especially on social media, Adam, you know how brutal, <laughs> how brutal social media could be. And I thought, yeah. I'm going to create a safe space. And I started a Facebook group called The Intimacy of Race. So that's how that started. And so um, to continue the journey, I also wanted to do something a little bit more than creating you know, a, a really safe space on Facebook. Mm. I wanted to have a live forum. And I got together really um, five other powerful leading women of color together to be on a live forum. And they each had like a 20 minute presentation followed by Q&A. And that forum was called the Allyship Awareness Forum. And it was really for people to listen and to learn and to take notes and to take it all in and not be in a reactive defensive mode you know how people say that's not me i don't do that i'm different yeah. i'm special i was raised differently and we're like no it's time you know metaphorically to take your knee off of our necks so yeah. that we can speak and you can listen and the book and i know you're doing some video here yeah. The book awesome. is, a, is a compilation of, it's actually a transcription of the live forum hmm. and um, infused with my personal stories of, I, you know, my dad was actually a bodyguard to Martin Luther King Jr. a week before his assassination. So wow. I infused a lot of my, my personal story and history in there, but also all of the amazing content those women shared as well. Hmm. That's amazing. And I think like, it's it's really great as well how you've, you know, created this community and this group and in this book, you know, to provide value and to connect with, you know, the people, you know, from, you know, like last year and, and some of the, the experiences and things that happened. I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of distress and a lot of trauma and a lot of things that happened. And I think like, you know, it's that kind of, how do I pronounce it? like that unity, that kind of unity and that kind of unite between people and, mm -hmm. and to, to connect. And I think people, people, that's what, that's what people need during those times. People need that. You kind of unite you know, unity and connection and, to, yeah. you know, to, to feel heard and to share how they feel. Because I mean, there's like a lot of, like I said, a lot of people saying all eyes matter and all these things. And there's a lot, you know, a lot of controversy over that. And, you know, I think, it, I think, you know, in my mind, it's wrong what happened that shouldn't have happened. And mm -hmm. things like that shouldn't happen, like, full stop. Um, and I think there's there's uh, a lot that needs to kind of be looked into, you know, to, to prevent that from happening. Um, but I think it's definitely great what you're doing to to put out, you know, your, your experience, you know, your kind of what, you, like you said, your father you know, what he did and, and experiences and to pour everything into a book and to, you know, to create that community as well. Yeah, there was so much um, done this past year to create division and deeper, deeper division because just emotions were just so high and so raw. And, you know, how do you channel all of that? Because in the black community, a lot of pain and trauma and grief was unleashed. And in the white community, a lot of guilt and shame for the history mm. of this country that I live in, America, was being felt as well. And so you had yeah. sides both experiencing uh, traumatic events mm. <laughs> in a way. Mm. And at some points, it became competing traumatic events. <laughs> like, yeah, no, yeah. my my trauma is deeper than your trauma, no, my, you know, and so in order to not make it competing, but to really, you know, the ugly history that this country has with racism has got to be faced. And for me personally, sharing stories and hearing people be surprised mm. 
really um, confirmed how disconnected people are of the history of this country because mm. of what's taught in school, but also how embedded systemic racism is into our fabric and our life and our way of being that we don't even notice it. Mm. It's barely noticeable when you're a person of privilege. And so having people become more aware of what racism looks like and how it shows up to benefit you, how it shows mm. up to disenfranchise other communities, really force people to look at some of the ugly truths about mm. themselves, their family, their history, their generations. And it's really not an easy space to be. It's not mm. an easy space to be. And so it's easier to deny it, to mm. deny that it exists. And mm. that's what keeps racism alive is denying yeah. that it exists. Yeah. So I think, as you said, it's, you know, people need to, I think there needs to be some kind of like education on it. There needs to be like more kind of awareness kind of talk to people around you know history and and, and what kind of you know to me some kind of like education somewhere and, and knowledge on it because i think like half a lot of the time people in families you know might think a certain way and then their kids all think a certain way because their parents are thinking xyz and it's like well there's a whole wide world out there and people can just get caught up into, you know, thinking a certain way. And I think it's wrong. And I think, you know, all people at the end of the day, regardless of, you know, sexual orientation or like skin color, that kind of thing, all, you know, one. And, it, and, it, and it's it's crazy that you see certain things and hear certain things and that people think certain ways. And I mean, it's... I mean, have uh, you noticed how unleashed people who have racist ideals and values, the freedom that they felt mm. in America. I'm sure you, I know the, the world has been watching us for at least the last four years mm. with the leadership that we had in place and just yeah. how bold and embrazened people were with their hate mm. and their hate rhetoric. And I'll be honest with you, those were not the people that concerned me. Mm. What concerned me is the people who had been hiding how they really feel yeah. all of this time. And then all of a sudden they had permission to share it in a bold, empowered way based on the leadership that we had in this country up until mm. recently. Mm. And it was, it was scary. It was really scary to witness. Yeah. I, I definitely pay attention to the, to the news, um, some news outlets and, you know, I've got friends who, you know, living like yourself, live in the states, and, and update me on what's happening. And yeah, it was it was pretty pretty crazy to see. And I think it's it's almost like a pressure. You know, it felt for me it was like a pressure cooker. You know, mm -hmm. like just you know with COVID as well on top of that and everything happening, mm -hmm. it was like you know things could just pop off. And you know, it, it's a it's a scary situation to be in. Um, I don't I don't know how. I know there's there was lots of riots and things like that in like New York and there were riots and protests everywhere. Well, there were protests everywhere. Let me yeah. put it that way. Some of the bigger cities saw some rioting, um, which actually gave the whole Black Lives Matter movement a bad name. But you know, mm. when you look closely, you know, um, there's a you know, people all over were quoting Dr. Martin Luther King and nonviolence, but one of the things Dr. King did say that I quote a lot is that the rioting is um, as a result of voices not being heard. It's the language of yeah. the unheard. And, you know, we have been talking about this problem for a long, long time, but have really been unheard. We've literally had a knee on our necks metaphor. I, I think it's so... Yeah metaphoric how this this man was murdered by the police officer mm. was you know a knee on his neck and that's how it's felt for us and mm. the fact that it happened during a lockdown and during covid exposed it yeah. at a higher degree that people were in their homes watching the news over and over again and you know it just broke open something in people, some good, some bad, you know, but something was, the dam was 
was burst mm -hmm. and people just wanted to be heard. And we came to the point where, you know, it's enough, it's enough. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I look at it as, you know, ways that I've have become um, resilient mm -hmm. to the injustices and being raised in the same society that um, promulgates racist ideals, you know, I've taken on some of them myself in my opinion of my own people and my own community. I mean, that's how embedded it is in the fabric mm. of this country. This country, America was built on racist ideals, values and principles. And the more mm. I started doing more of my research and education for myself, the more, um, I don't want to say enraged, but the more yeah. pain I became in, came in, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to channel that to make a difference. And that's mm -hmm. why, you know, I have the, the group going, I go in live in the group, sometimes with a guest, sometimes with me to just mm -hmm. really share more things to help people become more aware and conscious and intentional to make a difference. And, and that's why I wrote the book. Yeah. No, it's, it's awesome, you know, what you're doing. And I think, you know, these little, you know, little tiny, like, how can I put it? It's like, it's like seeds, isn't it? You know, you're planting these seeds and, the, and, the, and they're, they're kind of like, you know, kind of growing and and kind of blossoming. And I think it's, that's like, you know, the way of starting, isn't it? You're planting these pods of seeds and getting people together, you know, getting people together and, and putting that forward. I think that's, you know, and I think by doing that, more people are going to do that as well. And more people are going to get involved and 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 create that that kind of positive those those positive connections and that kind of um like you know that voice across isn't it yeah i mean i, I love how you use the analogy of seeds i do that a lot because the problem is a lot of us try to plant seeds when the ha the the ground is still hard and frozen <laughs> yeah and so the first thing we have to do is prepare the soil and that's yeah. what i'm hoping the book does the book mm. is supposed to prepare the soil so that we can learn how to plant seeds and have those seeds mm. start to germinate and mm. take root and so yeah. we really are in the soil preparation stage of this mm. so that our seeds can grow <laughs> yeah that's yeah. it that's it and i think i think it, i think it's really nice and i think it's it's that um you know, like how the you know the impact it's going to have in a positive way on people, and you know, you you're following something that you feel strongly about and you're passionate about, and I think everyone should do that. You know, like if they feel passionate about something, they have they have something to say. You know, to kind of do these kind of things, and yeah. I think like you know with racism and and you know many other things, it's 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 something like you said, it's gone on for a long time, and it's almost like. You know, I think in people's, you know, DNA, it's in your, you know, your DNA, isn't it? And yes. I, like, my, my, I haven't gone by myself too much, but like my ancestors, like Native American on my granddad's side. And if people cut down trees near me, I, it's like, I feel it. Mm -hmm. I don't, I can't explain it. And I'm like, I feel angry. And I'm like, I can't explain why I'm feeling what I'm feeling, but I, you know, it, it's things like that. And I think to myself, oh yeah, it goes back, you know, it's, it's, it's in my DNA and I think you know with 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 this it's there's there's definitely a lot a lot there and I think this is kind of the way forward you know by by doing groups by by educating other people on it and I think it's something that is you know gaining more momentum now you know these 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 positive movements if that makes sense yeah it does and you know and it's interesting you should mention that because you know the more research I do the more I'm learning how trauma is not only held in the body, but it's passed down through the generations. And it was a new experience for me to experience that level of grief and trauma over watching somebody I don't know. Like yeah. I love good murder mystery. You know, I, I was sharing yeah. with you offline how I love the, um, a lot of the British crime drama yeah. series that we've been catching up with on Netflix. So I watch this all the time. That's um, one of my favorite subjects when I was in high school was, forensic scientists and fingerprinting yeah. and how you catch the criminal so i i actually like that stuff which is why i put trackers on everybody's phone so in case i need to find their bodies that's what i tell yeah. my <laughs> <laughs> but 
<laughs> to feel that level of pain and grief was so new to me that it scared me. And I really mm. thought, is this what ancestral grief and trauma feels like? Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, people talk about, you know, the blacks in this country, the way we're thought of, you know, we're overweight, we're not healthy, we have high blood pressure and diabetes. And the more I'm studying to see how the history of trauma lives mm. in our body and contributes to a lot of the diseases that are prevalent mm. in our history and our generation, along mm. with lack of access in some communities to fresh fruits and vegetables and organic yeah. foods. I mean, I'm blessed. I live in California. I have a garden mm. and, you know, I've got access to organic stuff and I've always have been but yeah. some of the other poor communities don't and then you go into how victims are blamed for their circumstances I mm. mean one of the things I was hearing a lot was well what about black on black crime and what about what you guys do to each other and what about this and what about that and that's victim shaming and blaming which is yeah, very, yeah. very hurtful and destructive and so when you look at when you try to educate yourself more, and, and it really is about education, because mm. I honestly didn't know that the reason why, you know, a lot of Black um, families historically have these such serious health problems mm. is from the traumatic experiences passed down mm. through the, the generations. It's like, yeah. oh, <laughs> Now it makes sense because, you know, we all can be guilty of victim shaming and blaming, you know, mm -hmm. if you only ate better, if you only did this, well, you know, if you're mm -hmm. historically oppressed, I mean, I really have a soft spot now, a bigger soft spot for how hard it is for black men in America, especially if their skin color is really dark or they have a certain look mm -hmm. that white people will associate with fear and mm. attack and menacing because of how someone looks. I mean, could you mm. imagine going through life being judged because your skin is just too dark? Mm. I just can't. It's, it's, really, it's really a terrible thing. And I think I, I experienced that, I witnessed that I was, um, how old was I? I must've been like 15, 14, 15 years old when I lived in Nottingham. Um, you know, like quite a big city. Mm. And, um, you know, one of my friends is black and was walking through this town. Police officers stopped my friend. Mm. Search my, right, like they call like a, I don't know what the actual name, but like a random stop and search. Mm -hmm. They don't really do it as much now. But Profiling, they call it here. Yeah. And they, they, they stopped him and they searched him and then searched me, my friend. And we were white. And these two guys searched my friend. Mm. And I was like, you know, well, I wasn't doing anything wrong, and I, I couldn't believe it. And that was one Did of the first. Was... Going through life like that with that kind of fear, and especially being in the United States, that's how a lot of these murders from the hands of the police happen. Yeah, it's just, you know, I have a whole new outlook, perspective mm. on it than I did before. I mean, even some of the stories my dad shared about being a black police officer. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a handful on the police force in, in the 60s. And, um, you know, and I, I was a young child in the 60s and the white officers would not allow him in the squad car because of his color. So he had to be a motor, on motorcycle detail which is, you know, really was intimidating as a little girl yeah. seeing your dad and, you know, the motorcycle stuff and the helmet and stuff. It was pretty cool. He looked yeah. good. <laughs> like, yeah. That's my daddy. <laughs> but then he was pulled off of that detail, Adam, when Martin Luther King Jr. came to our hometown, and this was in 1968. Yeah. And he couldn't figure out why he was chosen. He wasn't a plain clothes officer. He was mm. in uniform but they needed plain clothes officers. And he found out after the fact that because there were death threats against Martin Luther King Jr., they didn't want any of the white officers in harm's way. Mm -hmm. 
So they pulled the African Americans to guard him in case Dr. King got shot. And he did get shot a week later when he went to Memphis. Yeah, it's it, it is it does baffle me, you know, with when things like that happen and how how things are set up and organised and you know things things you know, need need to change and I think it's um I, I watched a, I watched a documentary called Flint Town. Have you ever seen Flint Town? It's I've heard a bit about the water in Flint, Michigan, right? Yeah, and and it it focuses on the police force in Flint and. There was like you know a lot of kind of racism between like uh, you know police officers you know the white and black police officers because you know over who they who they were voting for and you know the election was going on and and you think you know cry this is in the police you know the police are meant to be doing their job protecting people and all this is going on. Do you Be- know how the police got started? No, they were no. originally slave catchers. That's how. In America, the modern day police force began because if you were black out walking around at a certain hour or whatever, unaccompanied by your master or whatever, or when you were a slave trying to escape, the police were organized originally to catch slaves who were trying to escape. And that mentality is still Mm. historically in the police force. And that's why the random searches, Mm. because as it evolved, it's like if they saw an African-American out and about, Mm. they were suspicious. Why are you out? Which happened in slave times. And you had to have a a letter or a note from your master if you were out running an errand for your master that you had permission to be out and about. And, you know, and so the police officers were put in place. They called them slave catchers back then to make sure that there were no random Negroes out and about when they shouldn't be or didn't have per, uh, permission. Yeah. Damn. So that that's why it's it's yeah, in yeah. the history of, you know, um, the birth of the police officers, they were originally mm-hmm. slave catchers. And so that's why that mentality is in there. It's, it's insane, isn't it? And I think I, I I've heard about, uh, I, li- I listen to Joe Rogan's podcast quite a lot. And he had, um, Oh, what's his name? I can't think of his name. He had that uh, that that guy on who um, he's he uh, basically kind of gets people to leave the KKK. If that makes sense, he kind of re- oh, what's his, mm. do you know the guy? Did you see that he's he's, a, he's no. quite a big guy? No, he, I don't. I don't know this guy, but I um, I've heard of people. yeah. And he's he uh, you know experienced racism growing up, and uh, he he talked about it, and you know through through educating people, you know people in the KKK, would they he convinced them to you know made them leave because he said, you know kind of woke them up a little bit, you know explaining, you know how things are, and you know like Joe Rogan said, you know the police forces need to be educated, you know they need to to, you know be educated in their training, and. Mm. And that's kind of, I think, you know, one of the main issues is, you know, they need to be educated and to be trained properly and not to to do things in a certain way. And, you know, people people need to have that education, you know, at an early age and throughout life. And it's, you know, but I think, you know, in what you're doing, it's, it's planting those seeds to prevent, you know, things from happening, if that makes sense. And people thinking a well, certain you way you can only do like one yeah. person at a time right yeah yeah and hopefully that has a ripple effect but you know yeah. when people say the system is broken especially here in america i'm really quick to let you know that it's not broken the no. system is designed to do exactly what it's doing and that mm. was to keep um f- free laboring slaves they just mm. call it the prison system now which yeah. is why the prison system is so overly populated with men of color and women of color mm. as well, mm. because um, there is a Netflix documentary called 13 that explains how that was um, 
it was about the ratification of the 13th Amendment yeah. and how they made certain things crimes so that they could put African Americans in jail and how these big companies use prison labor, which is free labor, to mm. keep their companies up and running. So it was really, when slaves were freed, it really destroyed a lot of capitalism in the United States. And yeah. you know what happens when you hurt people in their wallets, they get really, really upset and they do everything. Yeah to stop that. So it really takes ratification of the system. Yeah. You know, the this, system as it is needs to be broken and rebuilt. Yeah. There's so many kind of links to it, isn't there? It just kind of, there's so many connections and links to it. And I think, um, you know, I, I feel, I feel like sorry for people, you know, like you hear it, you know, in, in both white families as well, but like, you know, like kind of, single parents you know like a lot of single parents and, and and black people growing up you know and have you know having they need to have you know all people need, need to have you know like a positive role model or mentor and that kind of thing and and I, I actually had um a good friend of mine on the podcast he's he's got his own podcast and he's called uh, Derek Oxley and he and he was saying like when he was growing up you know his dad wasn't around and he said like you know the principal at school kind of kept him on track Mm. you know he said all he was bothered about was doing drugs and being with his friends and doing stuff and you know he he comes from you know like black black race and background and and he was saying you know it really helped him having that kind of role model and i think that that's something that you know a lot you know a lot of people need as well you know because i think do you, it's just what i hear about you know in the, in the media mm-hmm. yeah it, it it really it really is important to to have influencers and people in your life who can role model the way. You know, the problem is with how the prison system and the criminal justice system was set up, how many families that destroyed and broken up and didn't give these young boys an opportunity to have role models um, and to have positive role models and to really resort to, you know, behaviors for survival. And mm -hmm. um, so you've got to really look closer at like black history month is the month of february and yeah. it is about the black family hmm. you know that's kind of the theme about you know the traditions the love and the connection and the families but the way the system was built in the united states destroyed so many black families on a kind of a repeat cycle hmm. if you will and doesn't really give people a chance to to thrive when you're always in survival mode, you cannot thrive. It's mm. just not healthy. I mean, we just see it now, you know, affecting a lot of families in COVID. Everybody's mm. trying to survive, survive, survive. That That is so taxing on the nervous system mm. and on your mental health and your physical energy to just want to survive. Most yeah. marginalized communities like the black communities don't have opportunity to be in the thrive, to really take yeah. it to the next level and thrive and do well because of the races, ideals, and principles that are weaved into the system to keep us just trying to survive. And, you know, and it's unfortunate, but, you know, I'm hopeful. Mm. I'm hopeful that now that people are aware, they can do what yeah. they need to do personally at home, at work, in their communities, so that they can mm. um, be a part of the change be a mm. part of the transformation, but not just while things are in the news. No. But really just sustain it and make it a part of your life, which is why this mm. book is so mm. important because it really yeah. helps you know what you can do yourself, mm. you know, what action steps you can do to make a mm. difference. And it doesn't have to be anything, you know, like for me, yeah. it didn't take me to go out and protest and, and no. hold a sign and, you know, be on the front steps anywhere screaming. It just took me creating something privately, you know, sitting on my bed mm. in a meditation and mm. virtually making a difference. Yeah. No, I see. And I think that's, I, I really, I really applaud you for what you've done. And I think it's really lovely that, you know, you've, you've made this and you've created this group and you created this book and, you know, you're, you're making a positive difference and the, you know, sowing, put planting these seeds as well, you know, for other people to, you know, to learn and take value from and to do their, their part as well. I think it's, I think it's really something, I think, you know, especially, you know, in, in, in the kind of, you know, the time and day that we were in, yeah. you know, um, kind of coming together and, and doing that. 
yeah. but but then, you know I, no no you're welcome it's it's been it's been really really great talking to you and 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 um you know hearing about what you've been doing and and, and the, the topics that we've been talking about as well i think you know they're really important to touch on um you know in life mm. and to gain, gain more understanding on and uh where can people find you like your social media and like your website and your book and that kind of thing yeah well you can contact me at talkwitheva.com mm. so that's an easy way to find me and the book is, is um you know just my name eva medelec.com and then forward slash the intimacy of race book mm. and then you can really um learn you know it's available in the uk it's available yeah. uh, all over the world so um through amazon so yeah I uh, appreciate the support. I appreciate the shout out. It's an easy read. And mm. it really is how you can take just some personal responsibility to show yeah. up as an ally in your own life. So thank you for the opportunity. And you can go yeah. to the Intimacy of Race on Facebook and join that too. That's always fun. Yeah. That's <laughs> awesome. I'll yeah. I'll definitely promote you. I'll definitely promote what you're doing. And um, I'll definitely, you know, join the join, join the group and promote, you know, <laughs> everything. So and I'll, and I'll get a copy yeah. of it as well. And I'll, and I'll, yeah. I'll I hope you do. Yeah. I hope you do. Yeah. And maybe we'll have you as a guest in the Intimacy of Race group. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that'd be awesome. No, I look forward that to it. It'll be good. Yeah. yeah. Cool. cool. All awesome. Right. But um, you're welcome. But no, have a great day and all the best in what you're doing. You too, honey. Bye. Take care.